Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me first of all to Psalm 19. And we're going to be talking about a subject today that I, need, I really need the Lord's help on. Uh, so I'll let you get there and we'll pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you this morning for your presence that's already been felt and known in your worship, in the worship of who you are. And Lord, this morning we pray, help us with this subject matter that we're about to talk about. And may you make yourself known uh, for your own blessed word. May you graciously reveal yourself to us today uh, for your word and by your Holy Spirit as we cover the content of this message. Uh, help us, Lord, in our weaknesses to not only to deliver the message, but also to receive the message we are dependent on you this morning, and we ask that Jesus alone would be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to talk about a subject that's not really covered very much in these days that we're in, and it is the fear of God. Uh, the fear of God is obviously not a subject we hear very much, and there are reasons behind why we do not hear about the fear of the Lord. And I want to cover some of those reasons in this message this morning. And I want to cover the importance of the fear of God, the correct fear of the Lord. And we could say the number one reason why the fear of the Lord isn't really covered today is because there is a lack of understanding and a lack of revelation of who God really is and what God is really like. In our desire, in our goal to um, bring people into a relationship with God, which is in, a, in and of itself a good thing, of course, we have at times lowered God and made him lesser than he is in order to make him more approachable. But I don't think we should do that. I think we should keep God as he is and communicate God as he is, as he has been revealed in Scripture, Otherwise, we will fall into danger of making God something other than he is, and we end up worshiping not in spirit and in truth, but a God of our own devising and a God of our own imagination, even though we might be using the correct terminology when it comes to his name. So this morning, as we broach on the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord can only be given and communicated by the Holy Spirit to your heart. I believe the fear of the Lord is accompanied with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to turn to that verse today, but in John 16 and verse 8 through 11, you will see that the first work of God and the first work of the Holy Spirit is that when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. In other words, Without prior Holy Ghost conviction, you and I will not have the fear of the Lord as we should. It is communicated and given and directed via the Holy Spirit. And even though we're talking about the fear of God today, we will not get the true fear of the Lord unless it is deposited in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. But we pray that as we plant the seed of this message to you, that somewhere, if not now, at least some point in your life, this fear of the Lord will be manifest and watered upon uh, this seed and bear fruition in your life. Not every sermon that is preached and proclaimed bears fruit right away, but can bear fruit later on. So we go here to Psalm 19.9, and I'll just read this first. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean. In other words, it produces a cleanness in your life, a desire to want to please him by your conduct, by your life, by your action, because you are including God, you are aware of God's presence in your decision-making and in your life decisions you are consciously and have consciously been made aware of God. The fear of the Lord will bring a consciousness of God to your soul. And it will encourage a departure from evil 
and a pursuing of that which is right. So the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. How many of you know that there will still be a, the fear of the Lord in heaven? The fear of the Lord is not something that we will just have on this side of glory, but the fear of the Lord will be perfectly manifest in glory itself. This is an attribute or this is a quality that's put into our life which will be forever. We consider the great angels, the seraphim, how they have six wings. With two of their wings, they cover their face as they are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That is a fear. That is a reverence. But it is a godly fear. And it is a godly reverence induced by the greatness of the God they are worshiping. So we will not know the fear of the Lord in all of its fullness until we see him face to face. The fear of the Lord in your life will only grow to the point of your revelation and understanding of who God is. If there is no fear of the Lord in the church, then you may rest assured there is no clear revelation of who God is either. Goes hand in hand. So the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all together. The old French theologian, an Englishman can quote a Frenchman, right? It's okay. He says, the human heart is an idol's factory, John Calvin. And as we broach our Christianity, and as we di discover our Christianity, the most painful discovery that will be brought to bear on your life is the biggest battle is with your own heart. The biggest battle is not other people keeping you from God. It's not the church not preaching right, although that can be a problem. The biggest problem is our own hearts, number one. And that has to be something we address. When John Calvin said the human heart is an idol's factory, we are constantly inventing idolatry in our hearts. And that will be a problem till the day we go to see Jesus face to face. But thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, how could our hearts be cleansed and how could we overcome our very own self? Now, Psalm 50 verse 21, if you turn there, it reveals to us what the problem is. And this is going on. This is why you need to be saturated in the scriptures. Because there is a tendency in us, even though we are Christian, even though we are the people of God in that sense, there is a tendency in all of us to make God lesser than he is so we could raise ourselves more than who we are. But the real gospel elevates God, humbles us, and it is God who lifts us up by his grace. Notice this description here, Psalm 50 verse 21. The psalmist is reproving, or God through the psalmist is reproving the worshippers because they're making God just like them. The root of idolatry is love for self more than God. And if we love ourselves more than God, it's a guarantee that we will try to make God more like us. These things, he says, you have done. And I kept silence. Don't mistake the silence of God for his approval. The silence of God is more likely space to give us repentance. Amen? He doesn't deal with our sins right away because he wants to give us space to repent. These things you have done and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. Wow, isn't that an interesting verse? 
God himself reproving the worshipers and saying, you thought that I was just like you. Do we have that problem today? Do we try to make God like us to make him more acceptable? So we can reach him and we can broach him and we can stay just as we are. But notice that God doesn't permit that. Notice that there is indeed a need for Holy Ghost conviction in my life and in your life too. Because if left to our own devices, we will try to make God just like us. But God says, I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. So it takes a fresh revelation to break into our life to deliver us from such a practice of lowering God and making God like us. We need a clear revelation of who God really is. God is not like you. God is not like me. Although scripture does say we have been made in the image of God, um, God is separately holy. There is none like him who is like unto thee, O Lord our God. Who is like unto thee? No one is like him. Now the difficulty is, is when we make God what he is in scripture, then we have to admit that there is a gulf between man and God that cannot be broached by man. It creates a problem in our mindset where, where we realize that we can't find God on our own. In fact, we can't reach him. He's inaccessible. When we consider our sinfulness and God's holiness, there is a separation that cannot be changed by man. This is what we wish to avoid, this, this painful reality of realizing that we simply can't come to God on our own. We need God's help. Amen? John 6, 44 says that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last day. Who does that no one include? Is there any exception to that reality? Can any human being really find God on their own without God prior leading them to that process? We cannot find God on our own. Now there's a balance here with, with my message this morning because if all we focus on is this broach between God and man, the balance is, is that God actually lowered himself. Now let me be careful in my terminology here because God lowered himself without compromising any of his perfections, without compromising any of his holiness, without compromising any of his truth, God lowered himself, humbled himself, and the second person of the Godhead became a man. And he lived and walked among us. But make no mistake, Jesus was just as much fully God when he was a man than prior to coming down to earth. And he did not compromise any of that perfection that is required by God himself. This is what makes this gospel beautiful. Is that what we couldn't do, God did for us. God would be still today inaccessible if Jesus did not come. John 14, 6, a very well-known verse. Turn with me there. And this is still true today, that there can be no access to God outside of Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. There are people today who are saying, well, good Muslims can find God, and they can find their own way to God, and uh, good Hindus can find God. No, my friend. No, my friend. Now, you might say, well, aren't you being a little arrogant saying they can't find God? No. We're only going off of what Jesus himself said, that this is an absolute truth that cannot be altered, it cannot be changed, it cannot be compromised, but there is only one way that you and I can have access to a holy God, to God the Father, who if we tried to come to God and we saw God face to face in our own condition, we would die. Notice what Jesus said here. 
Jesus said to him, that's Thomas now, I am the way. Isn't that exclusive? Isn't that exclusive in terminology? I am the way. In other words, I'm not one of many ways. I'm the way, period. He's it. Outside of him, there is no way to God the Father. I am the way, the truth. If you want to know who God really is, then I'm the truth of that reality. I'm the truth. You'll learn the truth about God, and you'll learn the truth about yourself as you rely on me. And the life. There is no life outside of Jesus Christ. He's the life. The life that God gives at salvation. The spiritual life that when, he re, when, when, when he makes us alive who are dead in our trespasses and sins. It can only be found in Jesus Christ. The problem we have today is people are trying to find their way to God without going through the way, which is Jesus himself. I have people knock on my doors all the time, well-meaning, sincere. I invite them in. I talk to them. I plead with them. I point them to Jesus because they think that they're going to get into heaven by their own good works. And it's not going to work. No pun intended. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, and I think that's pretty clear, would you not say? No one, no exception, no one comes to the Father except, period, except through me. That's the key. Now, the beauty is our mediator gives us access to God because he is God. In other words, through Jesus Christ becoming a man, we, have, we now have access to Jesus, but we also have access to the Father through Jesus. Something that was completely impossible before has now been made possible. And when you consider the perfect holiness of God and the sinfulness of humanity, this is incredible to consider what God has done for you and me. It's amazing. Now, how can we know a God that could not otherwise be known? Well, God has chosen to make himself known through his only son, Jesus Christ. This is how we know God the Father. This is how we know God the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus the Son, we have access to the Father by the Holy Spirit as well. Now notice here that um, Jesus points out, we'll stick with John 14 for a moment, and let's go to the next verse. Um, Jesus said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. This is an astounding statement. What Jesus is claiming here is, everything the Father is, I am too. In other words, who the Father is, the Son is. I'm not just a reflection of who the Father is. I'm a full manifestation of who the Father is. In other words, what the Father is like, the Son is also like. And even in his humanity, he did not fall behind one iota of being just as much God as the Father is. He never laid aside his Godhood. That's a lie, my friend. The miracle is, is, that, is that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. Check that out. He never quit being God. He was always God. The miracle is he humbled himself and became a man. He was also fully man. He was also fully human. But he was born, even though it was a natural birth, it was not an ordinary conception. He was conceived in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. But you may rest assured he was just as much a man as you and me. But he had one vital, vital difference. He was without sin. Now he was born without sin. Because he was conceived in the womb by the Holy Spirit. But he remained without sin throughout his life. Because he's the only man that ever lived. That always said yes to God and no to sin. 
Now you consider sometimes, not only just in his action, but in his thoughts, in his life, in his soul, he was sinless. He was perfect. He lived a life of absolute perfection because as I pointed out to you, God never compromises. That perfect life had to be lived by someone. We couldn't live it. It was re indeed required from you and me, but we couldn't live this perfect life. But he lived it for us. And he went one step further, didn't he? He lived a perfect life for us. But you know what? My sin still needed to be dealt with. And I was still under God's wrath for my sin. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus took the wrath of God against our sins. He took it. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Consider that for a moment. What makes you today as a believer righteous before God? Is it you or is it Jesus? When Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. And that perfection, that perfect righteousness of Christ was credited to you and me upon salvation because he took our sin. He paid the price. So when you bring your sinfulness to Jesus and you bring your sinfulness to the cross, Jesus takes your sin and he exchanges that sin with his perfect righteousness. That's a gift. Amen? What he did for you was incredible. If we live like what Jesus did for us wasn't enough, then we are watering down the gospel. Don't water down the gospel. Don't water it down one bit. Because if it was left to us to save ourselves, we would be lost. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. But notice he says, from now on you do know him and have seen him. You've seen him through me. You've seen him through me, is what he's saying. Jesus gives you and me access to the father this morning. He's seated at the right hand of the father and he's praying for you. He's praying for me. If anyone sin, Scripture says, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Not that you guys ever sin, right? Sure, that never happens, right? Thank God for our advocate. Amen? Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, Scripture says, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness, all. My friend, if you've confessed your sin to God and you're still struggling and holding that sin against yourself, you haven't really trusted God with your forgiveness. You really don't believe that God has forgiven you. And it takes faith to take your sin and take God at his word and receive the cleansing at hand through the blood of Jesus. It's there for you. Quit holding on to your sin. Quit beating yourself up about what you did. Release it to God. Be forgiven. Walk free today because he was beaten up for you. Jesus was. Now John 14, 8. Philip at this point did not yet get it. Uh, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it is enough for us. Okay? We want to see him. Literally. With our physical eyes, we want to see him. Show us the Father. Notice Jesus' response, which is astounding. And I'll try to explain what Jesus is referring to here. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me? The Lord's patience with his disciples was tremendous, wasn't it? 
Let me ask you a question. Can there be a better teacher than Jesus Christ? Yet his disciples very often still didn't get it. How patient he was with them. Have I been with you so long? Could you imagine being taught by the Lord for three and a half years? Sitting at the Lord's feet for three and a half years? Reminds me of a testimony of a man who wished he'd lived in the days when Jesus was manifest in the flesh. He wished to see the incarnation. And this man would often pray and say, Oh, if I only lived when Jesus lived. And oh, if I could just sit at his feet and pray. And he longed that he lived at a different time when Jesus walked the earth. And finally one day as he's praying, a still small voice and a still small issue within him says, Who do you think I am? Think about that. We have another comforter. Another helper. A paraclete. The Holy Spirit, he lives within you and me, and he's come to teach us. So it, it doesn't matter how smart I am or how dumb I am. The Holy Spirit is my divine teacher. He's your divine teacher. And you've heard it said that the Bible is the only book whose author is always present when someone reads it. Why don't we ask his opinion about his own book, right? Come on now. Why are we trying to understand the Bible through our own cleverness when we have the divine author living within us who God breathed these scriptures, who, who instigated the writing of these scriptures, who chose the human authors so wonderfully and marvelously and caused them to write down what they wrote. We act and live like the Holy Spirit isn't even there half the time, especially when we sin. But he's there especially when you sin. Because he's your advocate, your helper. The one called alongside to help. We're not called to do this alone. We're called to do this through the Holy Spirit. Don't live like the third member of the Godhead isn't there. Rely on him, trust in him, draw from him in your hour of weakness and he will be there. For you. Have I been so long with you and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Isn't that an incredible statement? What Jesus was saying here is he's not claiming to be literally the Father because then it would be a violation of what we believe is the Trinity, right? One God in three persons. But what he is claiming is, I'm just as much God as the Father is. And if you want to know what the Father is like, then look at me. Amen? One in essence, in three persons. One God in three persons. One essence, only one God, but manifest in three persons. Do not confuse the persons, but do not think for one moment that the Father is like something that Jesus is not because they, there's, there's only one essence that they're in, right? And so he's saying, everything that the Father is, I am also. The Father is holy, so am I. The Father is merciful, so am I. The Father is just, so am I. I don't just bear these attributes remotely. I bear them in an infinite sense just as the Father does. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Hebrews 1.3. Turn with me there. Hebrews 1.3. You see, what we really need in these days is to see Jesus for how he really is which will cause the fear of God to be in our heart. This is a mixture, really, because I'll be honest with you, I, I, I love the Chronicles of Narnia, can't help it, love C.S. Lewis. And uh, I think as, as readily as someone could capture it in a picture form or a story form for a child to understand, I think the beautiful book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan the Lion, how he was so kind of, how can you put it, so loved by the children and yet feared by the children at the same time. I think that captures something 
of our relationship with our Lord. And Peter, when he was on the boat, if you remember, when the Lord says, have you caught anything? And he said, no, cast your net on the other side. He did. And he brought in a great catch. He fell at his feet. And he says to the Lord, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And the Lord touched him gently and says, fear not. From now on, you will catch men, right? Peter, at the times he forgot the fear of God, were the times he was rebuked, right? Remember? Jesus was talking to him about the cross, and he said, no. Stood in his way. Man, when you stand in Jesus' way, you're going to get rebuked. In fact, Jesus said, get thee behind me, what? Satan, Satan because you do not have in your mind the thoughts of God, but the thoughts of men. By the way, that happened on the same day when uh, Jesus, uh, you know, uh, commended him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, but flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. We like to say what a difference a day makes, but boy, what a difference an evening makes in that sense, right? You can be having a great day spiritually, having a wonderful day with the Lord, and then all of a sudden in the evening it's like, bang, where did that come from? Well, we're sinful. We need him. We need his help. Peter may have gotten a little self-confident there and says, ah, you know, I got commended there. But Hebrews 1, 3 from the King James Version, which I think translates this passage better than the modern translations. If you're a King James person, that was your opportunity to say amen, but never mind. Moving right along. Who being the brightness of his glory. So Jesus, this is a description of Jesus. Jesus is the brightness of of his glory, the Father's glory. So the Father's glory is seen in Jesus Christ. And the express image of his person. In other words, he is the, he is the express image of the Father's person. Here's a thought. Jesus is the word, right? Words convey an express image, do they not? Not just spoken now, but words are already words that are formed in your heart, right? In your, in your mind. I talk to myself all the time. I'm not crazy, I don't think. Maybe a little, it does help sometimes to be a little crazy. Because life gets a bit too monotonous sometimes. But Jesus is the express image of the Father's person. In other words, this has been the way that the Father has chosen to communicate himself to us, which is through his Son. Outside of his Son, you will not know who the Father really is. You may see his creation. You may have evidence and idea of the consciousness he's put within you, the morality and all of that. But you will never know God for who he really is unless you approach this God through his only Son. You will never have a relationship with this holy God unless you have access to him through his, holy, his only Son. I'll read the rest of the verse. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins... Uh, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. As we approach this revelation of who God is, and we, as we consider the humbling of God in, in, in the incarnation, in coming in the Son of God, we should never forget, and we should never lose sight of the fact that he's still the same God. Just because he humbled himself, he didn't diminish any of his perfection, any of his holiness, any of his hatred towards sin, um, any of his hatred towards wickedness. He's still the exact same God as he's always been. There is no change in God. There can't be. If there is change in God, then God isn't perfect. Now, this, we go to John 1.18. Turn with me to John 1.18. John 1.18 and this is where the fear of God needs to be revisited. Um, because John 1.18 tells us that no one can see God. No one has seen God. Um, because it's impossible to see God in all his glory. If we were to see God in all his glory, and we're in all our sinfulness, it would kill us. We would die. 
We would die, guys. God is so perfect and I am so not perfect that if God was to show up in his, in his unmediated perfection, I would die. You would die. But thank God he chose to show up in a mediated perfection. Think about that. Have you ever tried looking at the sun when it's fully shining? Is that why you wear glasses? It affects you badly. You can't. But oh, you can look at that sun when, when a cloud covers it and you can get an idea. To give an illustration, the sun hasn't lost any of its strength or power when it's covered by a cloud, but you can still see it. And I believe we're surrounded by examples of what the incarnation is. Jesus, in a sense, is the cloud, is humanity. But the fullness of the glory is enshrouded in that cloud. It's not diminished, one iota. And there were moments like the Mount of Transfiguration when that, when that brightness began to shine forth. John 1.18 have you ever met anyone that claimed to have seen God the Father? They're out there. <laughs> Do you know why they're out there? Because they don't know their Bibles. They're even preachers who are claiming to have seen God the Father. Do you know what I call them? Liars. Do you know why I can call them liars? Is because the Bible itself says, that, you know, and I'm not saying that always that they're intentionally lying. They may genuinely believe their own lie. But, oh, if you've seen God the Father, you wouldn't be here. You'd be dead. Just saying. If you saw God in all his glory, you would die. No man has seen God. So that means it's not subject to change. At any time at any time the only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father he has declared him he has made him known he has explained him to us he has brought forth the revelation of who God the father is you are not going to know who God is outside of the son it's impossible the arrogance and the pride in human beings claiming to say they know God the father without claiming God the Son. What you are claiming then, my friend, if there's anyone in here of that description, you are claiming to be able to approach God in your own sinfulness, your own unworthiness, and that God would just accept you the way you are. That is not only a diminishing of God, it's an ignorance of our own condition. Exodus 33, let's go there. I'm just going to look at these in passing, verses in passing, but let me describe to you some of the background. Moses, who had encountered God unlike any other human being. Think about that. God said in the book of Numbers 12, he said, If there be a prophet, I will make myself known to them, you know, in visions and dreams and revelations. But not Moses. So I, I, I speak to him, and the original Hebrew would be mouth to mouth. In other words, I speak to him directly. In other words, Moses was in the presence of God. But the thing we forget is, the angel of the Lord in the burning bush was Christ. The mediator was already there. Any encounter that any human being had with God in the Old Testament where they claimed to have seen God and it, and it was a correct claim. It was the mediator, Jesus Christ. It's the only way. So even before he came in the flesh, there were moments in Old Testament history where Jesus, as the angel of the Lord, did reveal himself to particular people. Moses had encountered God, and he wanted to see God more. And, it, you know, no one had encountered God like Moses did. This was, this was, he had an incredible experience, uh, yet he realized that, it, that he still hadn't seen God. And he made it his prayer, 
Lord, let me see your glory. In other words, I want to see your face. And, but he said, you cannot see my face, for, for man shall not see me and live. Is God correct here with this statement? We can't see God and live, even Moses. But if you remember, God says, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, I'll pass by, and you'll see my back parts, basically. And God declared his name, who he was, to the, to the people then. Jesus is the cleft in the rock for you and me. Amen. He's our protection. He's our coverage where we can see God declared and not die because we are covered in Jesus Christ. No one can see my face and live. Now, Genesis 32, verse 30. Jacob. Jacob, who was a wrestler, I guess. He wrestled with a man, Scripture clearly says. But we are told and indicated he was no ordinary man. Jacob knew he was no ordinary man. What is your name? And Jacob said, and he said, How, why do you ask my name? Seeing no one can really know it. And after the wrestling and after his encounter with this man, notice that Jacob um, calls this place by a whole new name. He says, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. Saying, and Peniel, by the way, means face of God. Face of God. Saying, for I have seen God face to face. Is Jacob correct here? Yes. He had seen Christ face to face. In the, even in the Old Testament, he was already set up prior as the mediator between God and man. And he had wrestled with him face to face. And notice the surprise, and yet my life has been delivered. Isn't our God amazing? God really wanted to make himself known to Jacob, but he couldn't come down in all his glory because he would die. But he came down in the person of the mediator, Jesus Christ, as he does to you and me today. Amen? Deuteronomy 5.24, there was a time in uh, Israel's history when God spoke to two million people at the same time. It's never been done before or since when they verbally, literally heard God speak. They heard him audibly. And you know what? They didn't run to the mountain and said, this is really great, guys. Let's come on in. Do you know what they did? You know what they did? They trembled. They were afraid. And they said, we don't want God to speak to us anymore. <laughs> we'll have Moses speak to us. And you know what? That, that, that was good because they realized, man, we can't, we can't go directly to God. We're not worthy. He's, he, he puts the heebie-jeebies in us. We're scared. We're afraid. Such power, such authority. My friend, Israel had Moses in the Old Testament. We have Jesus Christ. Moses is a type and a shadow of the mediator that was to come. When they said, we'll have Moses speak to us, not God. You know what? When we say, we rephrase that, we have Jesus speak to us because he is God. Amen? <laughs> Think about that. We'll have Jesus speak to us because he is God. And he speaks to us in a way we can receive it and understand it. He speaks to us as a fellow man. 100% man, 100% God. Amen? But notice he's reminding them, Deuteronomy 5.24, And you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Man, that's scary. I think we've lost that, guys. I've lost it. I don't know about you, but I've lost that reality of who God is. And I need it back. And only the Holy Spirit can give that back to me and you as well. We love him and yet we should fear him as well. That, that's a healthy concoction to love him and fear him at the same time. Judges 6, 22, 23. Let's go, through, let's go there real fast. Here's Gideon. 
man of mighty valor. He's described in scripture, and yet usually when you see him, he's pretty afraid. <laughs> he's fearful. I think he's an example of how God can transform a human being into being what he wants him to be. Now, after Gideon had encountered the angel of the Lord, he offered uh, an offering and the Lord received the offering. And how many of you know an angel will not receive an offering? Because that would be idolatry. Think about it. But when God receives the offering and burns it up and rises up through it, which he does in two places in the Bible, that clearly shows that he's God this angel of the Lord. And I think angel of the Lord can be misleading because angel also means messenger. It's messenger of the Lord. It says, Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. No ordinary angel here. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So, the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament, and it's a reminder to us that we can encounter God like these people did and, and, and encounter God in such a way that we don't die through Jesus Christ, and that revelation is not, is not diminished in the sense of who he is. It's just communicated to us on a level that won't kill us. Amen? Isn't that awesome? Think about that. What a great Jesus we serve. And incidentally, this was where the name, one of the covenant names of God was formed, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is our peace. Isn't Jesus that to us this morning? This may sound surprising to you and may even shock you, but God delivers us from God. God saves us from God. You see, we need saving from our sin, but we also need saving from God. God is holy, and I'm not. The only natural response is then to judge me for who I am. But God, who delivered me from God, gave me God in the person of his only son. Amen? Thank God we've been delivered from God. Even to a point now we have relationship with him. We're his children. We're sons and daughters of the living God now, isn't it? What an amazing transformation has taken place. Judges 13, verse 22. Go there real quick. Oh, talk about parents that had, had a problem child. Manoah and his wife. How would you like to be the parent of Samson? Mercy. Lord, give us mercy. <laughs> You know, I've, I've got to say, guys, the thing, the thing that really humbles me as I look at these people who God used in the Bible, I don't see one perfect human being. They were chosen and used merely by his grace. Samson was a rascal. I mean, think about it. He married an unbeliever. <laughs> that didn't work out too well. He broke all his vows. He went to the wrong hairdresser. You should always ask your hairdresser's name before you let her cut your hair, just a thought. If it's Delilah, run. Say, thank you, I changed my mind. Why, why, why Delilah? But we'll avoid that song. And Manoah said to his wife, because, you know, they, they, th this was another indication where the offering was received and the angel of the Lord went up. It was a picture of resurrection. Read the whole story when you get time. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die for we have seen God. Did they die? No. Now the wife had to communicate some sense into him, you know, if he was going to kill us, <laughs> he would have killed us by now, right? My friend, we don't know the fullness of who God is because we haven't seen God. And our revelation and understanding of who God is is very poor. It's very low. It's very diminished. And we need a greater understanding of who God is. Um, your worship of God will never exceed your revelation of who God is. If we have a low view of God, we will have low worship. If we have a high view of God, we will have higher worship. 
Isaiah 6 verse 5. We'll go there. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And I said, after he saw this, Isaiah, Woe is me, for I am undone, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And we know the coal of fire that the Lord touched his lips with. And he says, you know, your lips are clean. Isaiah probably thought he was a pretty good guy up to this point. He was a Jew. He was a worshiper of God. It wasn't that he was a complete heathen here. He was a worshiper of God. It was the prophet Isaiah. And then he sees the Lord in all his glory. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. Revelation 1.17. Almost done here. Revelation 1.17. John, in the book of Revelation, encounters this mediator. It, thank God for the only mediator we have this morning, Jesus Christ. John encountered this mediator, and in his current state, he fell as one dead. He said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Oh, but it doesn't stop there, does it? But he laid his right hand on me. He gave me strength to stand, saying, fear not. When Jesus says to us, fear not, the awe is still there, the reverence is still there, but we have acceptance and confidence in his presence at the same time. Fear not, I am the first and the last. 1 Timothy 6.16, let's go there. Just a declaration this morning of who God is. There is no one like him. 1 Timothy 6.16, Paul often finished some of his writings in a tone of worship and adoration of God. He says, who alone, God alone, has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. We can't approach him in our current state whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So as I wrap up here, guys, why am I covering all this today? Well, I wrote down the conclusion to the message because I want you to see it too. This is my own words, but I hope, you know, check it out if it lines up with Scripture. In considering these things, it shows us the utter foolishness of claiming we can approach God with no mediator. We can't. We need a mediator. We need a go-between. We need someone to take the place for us. We need Christ. It took no ordinary mediator. It couldn't be an angel. It couldn't just be another human being, period, although he was fully man. Let's not forget he was also fully God. It was God of very God our mediator was. Nothing short of God could be our mediator. This God also became a man, and he was the perfect man. The perfect man was necessary because we worship a perfect God. The perfect life that was lived is a perfect righteousness, and that perfection was credited to us. The application. This is the application to the whole message. We must come to God only through Jesus. There is no other way. If you come to God through Jesus and Jesus alone, you will be received today. Amen? How do I know that? Well, let's close with a promise of the Lord. And I'm going to call Daniel and uh, Butch out to share a song. But I'm going to offer a moment here. If you're in this place and you need Jesus, as these guys close with a song, we'll pray with you. But this is a promise of the Lord. I don't care what type of sinner you are. I don't care what you've done. This promise, my friend, is for you if you are coming to Jesus this morning. Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me.
That's a prior work of God working in your soul. And if you have a desire to come to Jesus this morning, you may rest assured that's not humanly designed, humanly initiated, that's been put in your heart by God himself. And whoever comes to me, who does that cover? Anyone, possibly. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Do we believe that this morning? Come just as you are, my friend. You can't change yourself. Bring your sin to Jesus, and he will receive you. He will take that sin to his cross. He will forgive you as you give your sin to him, and he will deliver you this morning. And you will be a child of God forever and ever. And that is, my friend, the only way you and I can be free. We can't free ourselves. We've got to come to Jesus. So as these guys share a song, they didn't know they were going to share a song. So I like to surprise them sometime. It's, it's the charismatic in me. I can't help it. Uh, no, go ahead. All right. Beautiful song. Psalm 46. Guys, if anyone needs prayer, come on out. We'll pray. I know Gordon and Ben will pray with me. And... Uh, my wife also, back there, and Donna, if anyone needs prayer. If you happen to be a lady, I prefer the ladies pray with ladies. They, ladies understand each other better, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's why. So, God bless you. Let's stand. If anyone needs prayer, we love you. Jesus loves you more importantly. And uh, bring, bring our issues to the Lord, whatever it is. Yeah.
The earth bows and all the mountains move into the sea. Lord, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Father, to hear your word, just let it permeate our hearts, Father. Let us be able to get to know you and know you more. And may it bring you honor and glory. We just praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen.